is about five minutes late just because I know our parking is really difficult. But we're still trying to figure all of that out, so thanks for your patience with that one. Um, just as an introduction, my name is Ashley Trough. I am the agriculture agent here in Durham. I've been in that position for about a year and a half, and basically what it means is that I work with everyone from home gardeners through landscapers and farmers, basically. Like, if you're trying to grow a plant or animal in Durham County and you're having a problem, or you're just excited and want more information, a lot of times that gets routed through me. So um, I'm here to answer all questions. I will admit that my real passion is uh, home gardening and landscaping. So this is what I'm really excited to talk about. Um, just as a little bit of an orientation to our talk, we're going to start with actually a little bit of background on extension, just like a little minute so you can figure out what this building is that you're in that you maybe have never been in before for this agency you've never heard of before. Um, and then we're going to talk about growing vegetable basics. We're going to take a, a short five minute break just to stretch your legs after that. And then we're going to go into starting vegetables from seed and finally kind of a roundup of the greatest hits of warm season vegetables and some kind of tips and tricks. I will be sending my slides out to all of you after this, so don't worry, right? Like you will get all of this information. You will see I tend to have a wordy PowerPoint style, and it's because I know you're gonna get it later and be like, wait, what did that picture mean? So I tend to put the text on the slide so you can see it. You don't need to write it down, you'll get it, okay? So this is the first class in a four class workshop series that we're doing. Um, called Bull City Gardener. It's our first year doing it, so woohoo, we're getting it done. Um, please sign up for more if you're interested. I would say that especially um, our next class, The Dirt on Dirt, which is all about soil and building and managing soil, is a really good class and it's really informative and it's not something that we think about a lot. A lot of times we're like, the plant is above the ground. The plant's the part I can see. And it's like, that only exists because of what's happening below ground. So it's really, um, I think, a good class series. So a little bit about like what is cooperative extension, right? Cooperative extension is a really amazing network of educators, researchers, and volunteers. This was actually founded by Act of Congress over 100 years ago so that the land grant colleges, which in this state is NC State and A&T, they were doing really, really amazing applied research in like agricultural and mechanical arts. And it's one thing to figure out how to grow a blueberry plant better. It's another thing to say, I should talk to a blueberry grower about that, right? We need to get that information out. So we're really extending the reach of the land grant colleges. Cooperative extension is in every state in the county, or every county in the state, every state in the nation, right? So you can always find a cooperative extension office that can help you with your problems. The main ways we do that, we have workshops, classes, field days, tours, this sort of stuff. We also, man, we love a good written document. Like we love a PDF we can send you with more information. Um, so. There's a lot of that. And a lot of it's really amazing because everything we do is research-based. So throughout this talk, you'll hear a little bit of like my own anecdotal evidence, but the meat and potatoes of this talk is all research-based, right? This is not like some family lore. This is, this is coming out of our research institutions. Also, we take a pretty agnostic approach when it comes to conventional versus organic. So whatever sort of chemicals you want to use or not use, we are there to support you in figuring out how you do that. Okay, so. All of this talk will be through a lens of, I'll present some organic options, but I'm totally cool with anything you want to do as long as you're doing it according to the label. Uh, one of the really cool things about Cooperative Extension here in Durham County is that we have some non-traditional programs. It's what they're called, so this includes Welcome Baby and Kids Voting. Welcome Baby does really, really amazing support for babies age zero to five. So uh, car seats, clothes, teaching classes, figuring out how to navigate the school system. Kids voting gets kids involved in the voting process. So we do a lot of really cool work here beyond just like agriculture and 4-H and FCS, which is all the things you wish you had learned in home ec but didn't. So like the delicious smells, that's our FCS agent, right? Teaching a class over there on cooking. If you need help with gardening in particular, uh, reach out to the Durham County Master Gardeners. So two Master Gardeners helped check you in today. One was Bev Tishy. I don't think she's in the room. The other is Marianne Chat. Both of them are phenomenal. To become a Master Gardener, you have to go through 16 weeks of training. Uh, you do field trips. You do get training from kind of the best and brightest researchers in the area on different topics. And then you have to do kind of a serious commitment to volunteer work and to continuing education. So these are people who really know their stuff 
And if they don't have the answer, they get it to me. And if I don't have the answer, I get it to the specialist at NC State. Right? Like, we'll work you up the chain. We will figure out what's going on. If you think that all sounds cool, but you're not ready to talk to a person yet, um, like introverts of the world unite, um, there are many other ways to check them out. They run a blog. They have a Facebook. They have an Instagram. There are many ways to interact with us and reach out to us if you have questions. Finally, um, a lot of what you're going to see here is actually from this book, The Extension Gardener Handbook. This is a book that was released just two to three years ago, and it's actually been updated even since. Released by NC State, written by extension agents and specialists from NC State. Uh, it is specifically geared to North Carolina, growing conditions in North Carolina. It's phenomenal, and it is available for free online. Right? What we're doing is chapter 17 with a little bit of chapter 16. Okay, so if you want more information, everything I'm going to be talking about here is really laid out in good detail in this book. You can get a hardbound copy. It's beautiful. It's fun. Who doesn't love a textbook? But it is just available for free if you want to produce it. All right, so we're going to get into the growing vegetables talk part portion of the talk. If you have questions and you feel like they're relevant to everyone, please just stop me uh, and ask your question. It's terrible to have to wait like an hour and a half with like a question burning in the back of your mind. So this is a really cool setup that I really like. This is actually Craig LaHoulier's um, setup in Raleigh, North Carolina. If you've ever done kind of a deep dive into tomatoes and you found a book called Epic Tomatoes, or you heard of the North Carolina Tomato Man, right? That's Craig LaHoulier. He used to sell at the Raleigh Farmer's Market. He recently moved to the mountains. He's helped develop whole new cultivars of tomatoes, and he does everything in containers and bags on his driveway. He recently got more into straw bales, so we released a book on that too. But like, this is kind of a great example of what you can do even with some serious space constraints, right? He just bred new cultivars of dwarf tomato and put them in containers and like was successful doing that. So we can make this work for everyone. So the basics of growing vegetables, I'm sorry to break this to us, to all of us, because like this is a willow oak loving town. You need full sun. Full sun does mean six plus hours of sun a day on that site. Um, any less than that, you're, you're going to really struggle to get the production that you would want. Does that mean that if I had five hours, I would still try it? Yes, I'm a gardener, right? Like we are an optimistic bunch, but six or more hours is going to do better. Once you've taken care of sun, you need to think about your soil, a well-prepared soil, and we'll go into this in a lot more detail. pH between six and six and a half. Um, a little bit higher would even be better, to be perfectly honest, but our soils are naturally a much lower pH than that. So like, if you can get to six, let's call it a day, be happy. Um, you also are gonna need adequate nutrients and organic matter. Tomatoes, well, I always think of tomatoes because I'm a tomato lover, vegetables. Um, we're asking so much from these plants, right? It is not enough for them to like grow and be vaguely attractive. We are actually actively taking resources from them all the time. Like you need to produce extra sugars and extra structures and everything else so that I can steal it and make a salad, right? So we're really kind of pushing these plants pretty hard. So you do need to think about nutrients and fertilization more than you would with a lot of ornamental plants. Uh, and finally, you need consistent water, but you also need good drainage. And again, this comes back to soils. We have what is kind of politely referred to in this area as moisture retentive soils. We have clay. We have compacted clay. So we'll talk about kind of some ways to get around that. So this is going to be a theme I'm going to come back to just because I love it. It is really, really all about the soil. And so, but what do I mean by that, right? So when we think about soil, soil is, um, this is kind of an idea of an ideal soil, right? So different plants like different things, but in most cases, if you start with something like this, the plant will ha be happy. And this is something um, I heard in a talk recently that I really liked was this distinction between basically space and stuff, right? About 50% of that ideal soil is going to be made up of water and air space, right? So it's not super compacted. And about 50% of that soil is going to be made up of stuff, which is 45% mineral, 5% organic. Okay, the reason you want that heavy mineral component there is because if it was all just organic, it would just disappear basically, right? It would get eaten by bacteria, it wouldn't become anything. This is like what the soil is made of in terms of rocks, minerals, all that other stuff that the soil comes from. 5% organic doesn't sound totally high. In our climate, 
It's extremely difficult, actually. And so this is where I have to break to you some stuff about Durham soil that you probably long have suspected, but I will just confirm it. So we have soils that are considered very old from a geological perspective. And the reason for that is because we have high temperatures and high humidity. And so all sorts of soil degradation processes happen faster when there's high temperatures and high humidity. Bacteria and fungi and everything else eat organic matter faster when there's high temperatures and high humidity, right? So basically it means that like you couldn't do carbon sequestration in our soils because the bacteria would just eat it and like shoot the carbon back into the atmosphere and be like, I am success, right? So 5% is actually quite hard. And then even more than that, old soils, oftentimes the sands and the silts have broken down into clays by that point, or they've been weathered and only clays have been left. And so a sand, you can, a sand particle, these are kind of the three major particles of soil, you can think about as like a beach ball, right? It's big. If you put a bunch of beach balls in a container and you poured water through it, it would just go straight through, right? Silt, you can think about more like a tennis ball, but not fuzzy, but that size. Put a bunch of tennis balls in a container, pour water through it, and like it moves, but like it's not like beach balls, right? Clays, you can think about actually more like grains of rice. So you've changed size and shape. Many of our clays are very, very flat. And so if you put a bunch of rice in a container and you try to pour water through, like it's gonna get through, but it's gonna take a minute, right? Like it is gonna hold that water. And so for kind of the, the nerdier among us, what does that look like, right? This is sands from just like a kind of a magnified version of the sand, right? This is clay from like a microscopic level, right? And the clays are often even sheets. So they really can pack in, right? Another way to think about it would be like cards right, just packed in, holding water. And so this presents a real difficulty for us because one of the great things about clays is because of their structure, they hold nutrients super well. They are just like little nutrient pills. They're amazing. However, they also really hold water. Don't worry. I know this is sounding dire, but there's actually a solution to both the way that water moves through sand and the way that water doesn't move through clay, and it's the same solution. It's compost. Compost solves a world of ills. Organic matter allows all these different soils to have a better structure and a better kind of layout. It sort of holds water in the sands the way that uh, they don't want to, and it also helps space out the clays the way that they don't want to, and actually prevents too much water holding, which is crazy. So you really, really, really do want to think about adding that organic matter back into your soils, right? It's going to be hard to hit 5% if you're just like dumping it in the ground, but we're going to talk about some different planting strategies to allow you to get that high percent that you'll want. So once you've added your compost in, your organic matter into your soils, you got to think about how to kind of take care of it long term. Uh, one thing that's really nice is you can grow your own organic matter. So this is green manures. This is, um, you'll see listed at the bottom of the slide, a number of different plants, uh, cow be or sorry, cow peas, soybeans, millet, uh, crimson clover is a real favorite of mine. If you till them in when they're green, they're green manure. If you kill them, let them go brown, and then till them in, they were a cover crop. To me, that's kind of six and one, half dozen of the other, right? Like, that, it doesn't matter. The benefit to doing these sort of things, to planting on your soil when you're not actively growing your vegetables, is that it keeps your soil covered, which is always good. You can lose your topsoil real fast in a heavy rain, right? It'll just wash away and it takes like 100 years to make an inch of topsoil. So let's keep our topsoil protected, right? And then the other benefit to this is if you pick something like crimson clover, so a legume that naturally fixes nitrogen, it's adding nitrogen back into your soil. So it's protecting your soil and it's adding nutrients. Importantly, you do have to cut these in, right? So you wouldn't pull the plants out, you would kill it and you would like till it in with a hoe. The reason for that is because the nitrogen that the crimson clover is collecting, it's not doing that because it's like benevolent and wants to help its neighbors, right? It's doing that because it wants nitrogen. And so if you take, so it holds that nitrogen until it's dead when it starts decomposing and releasing the nitrogen back out from its roots. So make sure you do leave those roots in at least. Yeah. So can you harvest the cow peas, you know, and yeah. the beans and stuff before and it's still, you can still use it as a green manure? Yeah, because it's the roots that really need to be left in place, because that's where the nodules are, yeah. 
So, okay, so you've got your soil, and we'll talk more about that in, in detail in a little bit, but you've got your soil, now you're trying to think about different ways you can grow, right? So there are kind of three major methods that people think about in terms of rows, raised beds, and containers, right? Which is like the ultimate raised bed. Rows are a very, very traditional method. Um, in this area, you do want to build your rows up. You don't just like leave it level and plant in. You raise that row up by adding extra soil and extra organic matter on top. And again, that's a drainage thing. You're trying to get those roots a little bit out, right? Um, this is a good method if you have a lot of space. Uh, they can be wide enough for either a single or double row of planting, and you want a couple of feet in between the rows just for you to pass easily. Uh, the kind of the major downside to rows, I would say, is just that they take a lot of space. However, there's a reason you would see this sort of production in like more of a, well, a production atmosphere, and it's because it's much easier to manage, right? Like you can run drip tape just in straight lines down the rows. You can kind of walk cleanly down the rows. A lot of machinery that you might use would work easily on these straight rows. But like, I live right downtown. I don't, this is never gonna happen for me, right? Like that's not realistic. Uh, I personally think rows are nice too because you can always like gussy them up with cute things interplanted in your rows because you have so much space that you could like throw some wildflowers in for the bees. You know, you could do all sorts of interesting things with this. Uh, the next system that I think more of us are familiar with would be something like raised beds, right? So these are great because they improve drainage. Again, that idea of getting things up, right? I am not originally from North Carolina, I'm originally from the Midwest. And so when I moved down here and saw everyone had raised beds, I was like, that's so cute. Look at those cute raised beds. And it was like, no, everyone's like, our plants are drowning. We have to do this. This is not like an aesthetic choice. Uh, but they are cute. They can be made high enough to provide easy access. This is really nice too. A lot of times you'll see raised bed setups where the beds are even almost like this high. Um, and that's really great if you have any sort of mobility issues or if you have members of your family that do because then there's not as much bending and squatting and kind of all of this sort of stuff. Um, and weed control can be a lot easier because you have a really discreet amount of space you're trying to control weeds, right? And it's harder for the weeds to like, especially on the high beds, it's harder for them to get in. Um, this is kind of a, a like specific slide. No more than four feet wide. <coughs> you can't reach in to a bed that's more than four feet wide. At least most of us can't. And so it just becomes very, very difficult to manage the centers of your beds. You want them at least eight inches deep to get the benefits of that raised bed. And if you're planting over like pavement or some sort of uh, impermeable surface, you want them at least two feet deep, if not three feet deep. And that's just to give your roots room, right? To really go down. And you fill them with a mix of soil and compost. And again, you really probably only want, I would even say like 25% compost because it's gonna disappear over time. You're gonna to have to keep re-upping it over time. Like you need that mineral component to provide your sort of real thing you start with. And so that's why you go heavy in the topsoil. So this is something I think a lot of folks are kind of getting into is growing in containers. These are great for limited space. Unfortunately, bigger plants need bigger containers, right? We, you can only cram so much plant into so small a container. We will always try to cram more than that, more than that much plant into that container, but like it will not be happy, right? Uh, for best results, use potting soil, not garden soil, especially given that you know our soils are kind of heavy clay soils. I would so much rather just go out and buy nice, clean, like engineered soil, right, which is a potting soil, than to kind of like re-handicap myself. Uh, slow release fertilizers work well. You obviously have no need to soil test because you know what was in the bag. You can basically, if there was fertilizer in the bag, it will be printed on the front of the bag, right? If, if there wasn't, there's no numbers printed there. So you know what you're getting. This is the main downside to containers. You need to water them daily, especially in the summer. Um, my containers always look really good until about the end of July and then I get very lazy and I don't want to go outside and it's too hot and like everything just fries, right? Um, whatever, it was gonna stop producing soon anyway, it's fine. But just keep this in mind, that you need to figure out a watering system. Is there a particular time of day that's better in the summer? In, in general, I personally like to water um, as early in the morning as I can. Um, the reason for that is that if I accidentally get any on the leaves, it kind of evaporates off a little bit earlier. What? <clears throat> Excuse me, without burning. Right, exactly. 
Yeah, I mean, your lawns, anything you're watering, you actually want to water as early in the morning as possible. If you want to grow in containers or raised beds, but you like want the varsity edition, let me introduce you to straw bales. Um, these are really good for limited space and areas with a history of soil-borne diseases. So like where you know there are serious problems, you can do straw bales. Uh, this is not a totally straightforward method. Um, like you don't just buy a straw bale, put it down and plant in it. There's more steps than that. Uh, they're basically prepared by you. And it's a combination of fertilization, watering, and allowing to rot for two to four weeks. Don't be intimidated. You totally can do this. Many people do this. What I will say is that we have some really phenomenal master gardeners who this is like their jam and they would love to talk you through it. And I would rather, I personally would rather like hear what the process is before I just like go out and buy like a bunch of nitrogen and straw bales. I'm like, I'm gonna do it. So um, reach out to us if you want more information on that. All right, so we're gonna walk through uh, nutrition and fertilization, watering, and then just a little bit of pest management. There's a talk coming in May on um, more specifically like insect pest management. Um, if you want more information on that, like let's save the drama for when we get there. Let's just be excited about plants right now. <laughs> so nutrition and fertilization. So when you go and buy a bag or a pack or whatever fertilizer, it's got three numbers on it, right? It's got nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And they're always in that order, and the number represents a percent. So this is kind of the main jam of fertilization. You're knowing what you're getting, and you can figure out how much you're actually applying based on those percent numbers. The numbers do have to be stated on the bag, and they do have to be tested so that they can verify those numbers. So that's great. I think that's as far as most of us get in understanding fertilizers, but it's actually kind of helpful to know what those um, nutrients actually do, I think. So nitrogen is all about green leafy growth. So this is really the element that's gonna promote all of the, the shoots and the leaves and all of that kind of above ground growth that you're seeing that's not reproductive. Some of the deficiency symptoms you'll see will be yellowing that starts on the lower leaves and works its way up. Um, the plants can be stunted and fail to grow. Uh, this is one where you do actually want to not just go hog wild, but you wanna be like applying nitrogen based on a recommendation because if you have way too much nitrogen, they'll actually start to shed flowers and like abort fruit production. So they absolutely need the nitrogen to live, but if they have too much, they're like, I'm just doing leaves forever, right? And they'll stop doing everything else. So uh, don't, don't overdo it. Next thing, uh, phosphorus. This is all really about uh, root, flower, and kind of seed and fruit development. So if it's not green and leafy, phosphorus helps with that, right? So in this area, and I would say in general, only apply phosphorus if you have done a soil test and you know you need phosphorus. The reason for that is that phosphorus tends to build up in our soils really easily, and it's one of the major nutrients that contributes to things like algal blooms in our lakes and waterways, right? So this can actually become a huge nutrient problem, and you probably have enough phosphorus in your soil, especially if you've been adding compost. Oftentimes we'll get um, soil tests back from organic growers and like their phosphorus will just be off the chart basically. So you're probably okay on phosphorus, but just know that it's an important thing for plant growth. Yeah? So then what happens if you have too much phosphorus? So the real problem with too much phosphorus is like from a, like a nutrient management perspective. So like, like I was saying, the algal blooms, uh, serious problems in our waterways. Like it doesn't hurt your plants. It's just a like, bad gardening neighbor practice, you know what I mean? Um, and so one of the things I'll say though is that phosphorus is especially a problem. What phosphorus likes to do is it likes to bind to soil molecules and get caught up in runoff, right? So if you're seeing a lot of your topsoil running, you're losing a lot of phosphorus. Whereas if you have raised beds with edges, phosphorus is not as good at moving down as it is in moving in runoff. And so I'm like, oh, you shouldn't apply phosphorus, but I'm a little bit less concerned, right, if you have something like raised beds or containers where you know that it's not just running off the top. Yeah. Uh, finally, potassium. This is really for overall plant health and growth. So uh, this increases disease resistance, cold hardiness, drought tolerance, kind of all the plant's defenses, right? It's really, really good for that kind of stuff. It's also known, known as... Um, potash or potash, I've heard it pronounced both ways, and it leaches at a moderate rate, so 
just keep an eye on potassium, but you probably have enough. Uh, this is just kind of one that you need to keep the overall show running, right? And so that's just a kind of, those are the major plant nutrients, the macronutrients, if you will. There's a bunch of micronutrients too that your plants need. Again, because we have clay soils and they're like little nutrient bombs, you're probably fine on most of your micronutrients. Um, but one of the really interesting things that can happen is you can be adding nutrients and adding nutrients and adding nutrients, but you might not be getting the benefit. And the reason for that is because of actually the way that nutrients and soil pH interact. And this is like one of my favorite graphs ever, just because I think it's really, really interesting. Um, so a lot of our soils actually start at somewhere down here. Uh, 5, 5.5, and you can see that actually in that range, you could add phosphorus until you were blue in the face. It is just not available to the plant, right? Like, it's at a pH where the plant's like, I just can't even see it. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, there's no phosphorus here, right? And so that's one of the reasons why I say that if I could adjust anything, I would adjust my pH first to get it at least vaguely right. Because this 6, 6.5 window, it's not perfect, but you're like in the yellow range, yellow to green range for everything, right? If I could have a 6, 8 instead, I would take it. But again, kind of lazy, only going to add so much lime, whatever. I would take a 6 or a 6.5. Uh, and one thing to know is that lime does take something like six months to really act in your soil to raise that pH. So you kind of have to do it in advance. But it's always better to do it now than to do it later, right? Like, what's the best time to plant a tree? Ten years ago. What's the second best time? Now. Right? That's this kind of idea. And our soils are strongly acidic by nature. They will fight your lime. Right? Like, they will win eventually. You don't get to add lime once and be like, well, I added lime. Problem solved. Within a couple of years, your pH will start dropping back down. So how do you know all that? Oh, yeah. So, um, so if we added lime now, and then we're going to do a soil test in a couple of months. I would wait for the soil test to add your lime. Just so you know. We'll talk about that. Okay. Um, yeah, so if you do a soil test, and we have supplies out there, and if folks didn't, if folks only got the boxes and they didn't get the other handouts, we have more of those out there, so please do pick those up. Soil tests are free from the North Carolina Department of Agriculture um, from April through November. Right now, they are the exorbitant fee of $4 a sample. Right? Uh, it's, it's the best free soil sample you can get, right? Like it's very, very good, it's very helpful because the thing that happens is you do your soil sample, you get your results back in an email and you get a really cool report that's based on your soil and based on what you wanna grow. And I'm gonna walk you through how to read it really quickly because uh, the Department of Agriculture and their infinite wisdom spent a lot of time trying to make it very easy to read. They just like didn't explain it to anybody. So a lot of people get intimidated. So for a typical homeowner soil sample, you get something like this back. Um, what's really cool about this is that it is, again, geared specifically towards what we want to grow. So kind of the most important thing in terms of what we've just been talking about is the pH information, right? So for the homeowner soil test, you get this like bar graph back. Because like, I love that they were like, this is already intimidating, but a graph would make it feel easier and more approachable, right? So. <laughs> What they're telling you is you have a pH 5.4, and that's a little bit lower than this ideal range of 5.8 to 6.5. It's low, okay? But don't wait. They actually tell you how to fix it, right? So they go ahead and tell you, well, what you need to do is you need to add 40 pounds per 1,000 square feet. And you just kind of incorporate it in. There are a couple different kinds of lime you can buy. You can buy calcitic, dolomitic. In this area, it doesn't matter. Buy what's cheap and buy what you like. It's fine. Um, once you have your pH sorted out, they then also help you with those macronutrients. And so this is where they have the NPK fertilizer recommendation. Um, they say you basically have enough phosphorus. Don't worry about adding more phosphorus, right? It's between the two bars. You could use more potassium. And they're not going to tell you a nitrogen number. And the reason for that is that nitrogen is very widely, very hard to track down in these tests. But they know roughly how much you need for the crop you're going to grow. So they're like, why don't you just go ahead and add that much because your plant needs it anyway. Nitrogen is going to like, some of it's going to go into the air, some of it's going to go into the nitrogen cycle, whatever, just add some nitrogen, it's fine. You can't overdo nitrogen quite as easily as you can overdo something like phosphorus. Ooh. And so they even specifically tell you seven pounds per thousand square feet. I love this part too. Of a 15, zero, 14. That's a common one, right? That's like a 10, 10, 10. You're just going to find that at the store. 
The way I would interpret that is you need basically equal parts of nitrogen and potassium and you want no phosphorus, right? And so because those are percentages, you can kind of figure out roughly what that means. Um, I know that still sounds like Greek. Give us a call. We'll walk you through it. We'll do your conversions for you. We'll teach you how to do it. If you get your soil test back and you're like, Oof, can't deal with this, just reach out to us and we can help you, okay? So once you've decided, okay, I need a little bit of fertilizer, my soil test told me I did, there are three major types of fertilizer. We have slow release, soluble, and liquid. Slow release is the stuff you're used to kind of like Osmocote, right? Where it's got like a coating on it and it's going to take it a while to get out. This is really good because it kind of really adds that nutrient over time. A lot of organic, I wouldn't say organic fertilizers, but things like feather meal, bone meal, um, those sorts of things, they tend to be a little bit more slow release too because the, the microbes in the soil kind of have to work to break them down. Soluble fertilizers, these are applied as granules, but they break apart in the water race and they, they move pretty quickly. This is going to be like your standard 10, 10, 10. And finally, liquid fertilizers, um, this is something that like comes in a jug as a liquid. These are a quick boost, right? These are a rapid feed. Like I see deficiency symptoms, this plant needs something, right? Or these are seedlings and they need it now. That's when you use these. Don't count on these to do everything for you. I would way rather like eat a big hearty meal than just like eat a bunch of candy and feel good for a minute, right? Don't count on compost to do all of this for you. It's not the same, okay? Like a typical bag of something like black cow, right, is a 0 .5, 0 .5, 0 .5. That is not actually a fertilizer. It is an organic matter. That is helping your soils, like, formulation. It's not helping the nutrients that are in there. It's helping your formula, your soil be structured properly. Okay, they're not the same. So you got your soil a little bit figured out, you got your nutrients a little bit figured out. Moving on to watering. Uh, most vegetables require one inch per water per week from rain or irrigation. This is once they're established. I would say when you're starting things, always keep an eye on them and make sure they need a little bit more. Um, this sounds like a really kind of like technical amount of water. Like, yeah, you can get a rain gauge, you can measure it. You can get little like tuna cans, you know, straight-sided cans. You can put them out. You can monitor exactly how much water you're getting. You can keep it up. It's fine. Just keep the top inch of soil consistently moist. Don't add too much water beyond that. Like, stick your finger in the soil, see what's going on. Look at your plant. Is it looking wilted or is it looking kind of funny, right? This is, like, plants are, are living things. They will tell you kind of what they need if you just keep an eye on them and kind of see how they're responding, right? Uh, make sure when you're watering, though, that you are watering the roots, not the leaves. I know it's like really fun to be like, I'm like, my plants think it's raining, it's charming, they love it. They don't actually love it. They have to get through rains. It's actually kind of a really dangerous time for them because most of the diseases that they're battling like those sort of wet conditions on their leaves, right? Or the diseases are literally being splashed up from the soil by the rain, hitting the leaves. And so you actually want to keep your water as low as possible, right? Just for like some perspective, a commercial tomato grower grows their plants typically totally covered in something like a, like a high tunnel or a hoop house. And they add all the water at the base because they don't want any water on those leaves. Someone in the last class asked, like, does that mean that I should go out and cover my tomatoes every single time it rains? And I was like, life's too short. But just like, don't add to the problem, right? And finally, in terms of pest management, um, choose disease-resistant varieties. And so we'll talk through a little bit about how to tell which varieties are disease-resistant and which ones aren't. Remember, this means resistant, not immune. Like, you still need to do kind of normal best practices to keep your things going. I just really like disease-resistant varieties, even if I don't think I have disease problems, because I feel like it helps me protect my soil, helps me protect things like that where diseases could build up, right? If there's not a bunch of susceptible hosts sitting around, it's harder for a disease to get in there. Space plants properly for better air circulation. Again, that goes back to the water, right? Water sitting around, humidity sitting around, that's really good conditions for disease. So better circu air circulation is better. We all put too many tomatoes in a bed. Like we all, I do it every single year. Every single year I'm like, this is not the year. And every single year I'm like, but they're so small right now. And I just like cram more in. Try to resist the urge or at least like compromise with yourself to like kind of resist the urge. 
Uh, avoid overhead watering and keep it, it keeps the leaves wet. And finally, scout regularly to find problems before they become established, right? It's always worth going out at least once a week, looking over everything and being like, does this all still look like the plants I put in? Like, do these still look alive, right? Just kind of checking things, looking under leaves, seeing how things are doing. One of the absolute best things you can do for pest management is crop rotation, okay? It helps prevent pest and disease buildup, and it is just kind of really phenomenal because it doesn't, the different crops and different crop groups have different diseases. So if you rotate between the different groups, the diseases don't have quite the same amount of time to like really get their steam going, right? So you basically divide the growing area into separate spaces and consider different seasons. And so what do I mean by that? I mean, like in a best case scenario, you might have something like two or four raised beds, right? And in one year you'd be like, okay, I'm planting my tomatoes in bed one, I'm planting my beans in bed two, I'm planting my corn in bed three, I'm planting my squash in bed four. Um, and then in the winter, you would plant, you know, okay, I'm, I'm doing mustards in one, three, and four, and I'm doing something that's not a bean, or I'm doing mustards in all of them, right? And then next year, I'm not planting my tomatoes in bed one. I'm actually shifting everyone down, right? And so the reason I'm saying it that way is because the plant groups are what you're really caring about, right? So kind of like what I consider the truly the greatest hits of warm season vegetables are all actually in the Solanaceae, right? It's tomatoes, peppers, potatoes, eggplant, right? The stuff we get really excited about. It's really hard to keep good soil and to keep disease problems down if you're planting tomatoes in the same bed every single year. And just because you're like, this is the year I practice crop rotation, I'm putting peppers in that bed, like it doesn't work that way, you need something else. And so this dovetails really nicely into the idea of a cover crop in the winter. Like if you don't wanna do any winter vegetables, that's totally fine. Just throw some crimson clover down on that bed, right? It's gonna help you build your soil, it's gonna keep your soil covered, and it's not in the Solanaceae. It's a legume, right? So it works really, really well that way. And if you're kind of lazy and kind of forgetful and it blooms before you have time to cut it in, it's really pretty. So, extra benefit. Yeah. In terms of what the two top things, can you tell something's on the ground and something? Those are peanuts and those are like snap peas, sugar peas. Oh, okay. Yeah. All the brassicas, like, except for a couple of them, are actually basically the exact same species. Uh, we just decided to turn it into a million different things. So like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, those are all the same species. We just, the powers of breeding, right? Another thing that's really helpful and that I will like, this is a hill I'm willing to die on, is the benefits of mulch. Keeping your soil covered even when you're growing on it is super helpful. It helps prevent diseases splashing up from the soil, it helps keep your um, watering needs down, it keeps, helps keep weeds down, and it adds organic matter. Mulch is phenomenal. This can be any biodegrad biodegradable matter, two to four inches in length, so it can be, sure, it can be straw, it can be grass clippings, it can be leaves, it can be mulch you actually buy, it can be like top dressing with compost sometimes can even act as a mulch, right? Just keeping something to keep the actual soil itself covered. I really, really like grass clippings, Make sure you haven't applied some sort of weird, funky herbicide to your grass that's going to knock things out. Um, that's one. And also, by grass, I do actually mean grass. I don't mean this, like, <laughs> weed yard that most of us have, right? Because then you're just applying weed seed, right? And that is not helpful. Uh, but fescue lawn clippings actually are a really phenomenal mulch in terms of the amount of carbon they're adding to the soil. So this is just kind of one of those things you can do that is always going to make life a little bit easier and a little bit better. So I was talking to a newspaper and then mulch, which yeah. works phenomenally, but I don't know what I'm going to do because I don't use newspapers. <laughs> That's the only real problem with that. Some people do um, cardboard too. Just take the plastic off or like the tapes and that kind of stuff. Otherwise, like you just end up having like tape sticking out and you're like, oh, this was so cute. Um, okay, so yeah, sorry. What about the molds that grow out of mulch sometimes? Aesthetic. Yeah, for the most part. I mean, and some of them even have like really terrible names, right? Like there's like dog vomit. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, whenever I get those calls, I'm like, congratulations, you have a living substrate, the joys of soil, right? Like, I, that's, unless you know that you're prone to kind of upper respiratory problems or reasons that you really want to stay away from mold spores, 
I wouldn't worry about it. They are not the sort of molds that come into our houses. They're 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 outdoor molds, right? There's mold all through your soil all the time too. So is that um, for the molds that come on the top of the mulch and sort of on the bottom layer? There's, yeah, it does harm the plant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're 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 exposed to spores constantly. You know, um, you can just see this. Uh, the one thing I would say is that if you're going to use something, um, you know, it's always good to shred leaves. I don't have a leaf shredder. I just put them on and hope for the best. Uh, but what it's good to do is to break up that layer every once in a while because otherwise it can, you know how leaves like super compact and almost have trouble letting water through. So I like to kind of return it every once in a while just to, to get it going. But that's the only reason I would be concerned about a mold is like maybe it's become a little bit waterlogged, right? And it's causing it to bloom. So I would turn it probably, but that's about it. Okay. Yeah. So with that, we've kind of reached um, a good spot for like maybe a, let's say a 10 minute break, just to stretch your legs, ask questions, get more snacks. Okay, so we will meet back at 10.30.